for listening this evening. Amen. Good evening. Good to be with you and uh, able to preach the gospel among you. We're going to read tonight three passages from the word of God. The first one is in 1 Peter. If you have a Bible, if not, listen. 1 Peter chapter 2, very well-known verses, verse 24 and 5. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Another reading just over in the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 1. Verse number five, I'm breaking right in the middle of a sentence here, but verse number five of Revelation chapter one, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And a final reading in John's Gospel, chapter 4. And we're just going to come in at the tail end of the story of the woman at the well that many of you would know. John, chapter 4, and we'll read at verse number 40. So when the Samaritan... Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days, and many more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. I trust that God will bless what we've read from his word together tonight with what you've listened to at the opening of this meeting. I have three very simple things on my heart tonight to draw your attention to, and they all have to do with what belonged to the Lord Jesus, his own. We read of his own self, his own body in 1 Peter chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 1, we read of his own blood. His own blood. And then in John chapter 4, we read of his own word. His own word. We don't know if the Lord Jesus, when he was here on earth, had his own house. We don't know that. We know he dwelt somewhere, but we don't know that he owned his own house. We don't even know that he had his own donkey. We know he didn't have a car. They didn't have them, but they got around by donkey or walked. We don't even know that the Lord Jesus owned a donkey. We know he borrowed one. But. We don't know that he could put his hand out to an animal and say, this animal is mine. Some of you might own a pet, a dog. We don't know that the Lord Jesus had anything like that of his own. But we do know this very clearly from Scripture, that the Lord who existed for all eternity, the eternal Son of God, chose to come to earth and take upon himself a body. A body hast thou prepared me, he says to his father. And his own body, that was his, he lived in it, he he tabernacled amongst us. John says in 1 John, 
whom we have seen with our eyes, we saw his own body, who we have handled, we actually touched the living God of heaven, who is here in a body. It's quite a thing. Greek mythology has all these characters, these monsters that are gods from some other place that have all these, these weird bodies. But the Lord Jesus, he took a human body. He became like one of us for one purpose, that he might die for our sins. He became part of the human race. And yet there's a tremendous contrast in the verses we have read. We have read of who his own self, the sinless. If you read a couple of verses before that, you read about the sinlessness of Christ, about the absolute impeccability of Christ, who knew no sin, who did no sin. In him was no sin. And yet, in this text that we read, it speaks of our sin. Our sin. What a contrast. Even though he lived in a human body, he had no sin. Listen to what it says. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. There's not one of us that could do that. When we're reviled, before you know it, there's an answer comes out of our mouth. As soon as someone says something to us, we have an answer back. What a contrast. Though he lived in his own body, yet he was sinless. He was without spot. He was without sin. We're just the opposite. What a contrast. The verses that we read there in Second Peter have another great contrast. He is the shepherd of our souls. We are the sheep. What a contrast. The shepherd, the strong one, the savior, the guide, the sheep, the lost, the wayward. Complete contrast between sheep and shepherd, between us and him. What a tremendous contrast. And yet there's a tremendous switch in these verses. The verse talks about our sin, our sin. And you have heard about that at the opening part of this meeting, about our sin, the sin of our souls, the sin that's upon us. And yet what Peter is, is, is telling us in verse 24 is that there's been a switch made. Who his own self took our sin, and carried it on his own body. His own body with our sin. It's one thing if we carry our sin. We, we made it. It's ours. We sinned. We did it. It belongs to us because we perpetrated it. But he took our sin. Hard for the mind to grasp that. The sinless, spotless Lamb of God taking our sin in his own body. Our sin on him. Let me tell you just for a moment about the carrying of sin. The you and I are carrying our sin, and that sin is taking us down, down, down to hell. That sin is taking us away from God. While we carry it, it carries us. While we carry sin, the sins that we have committed, our sins control us. But when the Lord Jesus came, he came to carry our sin. We don't use that word much today. Who his own self bear our sin. It's an old-fashioned word meaning carry. He bare it. He put it upon himself. He carried our sins. Where did he carry them? He carried them to the tree. To the tree. Let me tell you about the cross for a minute. Because that's what the tree is. It's the cross of Christ. It's the cross 
where the Lord Jesus paid the penalty for our sin. It's the cross where sins were dealt with by God, by a righteous, holy God who dealt with his own son because of our sins. There's only one way that our sins could ever be dealt with. They had to be crushed and crushed by God. They had to be judged and judged by God, but they could only be judged in the body, not as an abstract thing, not as something floating in space. Our sins belong to human beings, to us. They were transferred to Christ. He bare them. And as a man, a real man, our Savior, the sinless, spotless Son of God, carried our sins to the cross to be judged by God. The psalmist says it like this, all thy waves and billows are gone over my soul. What's he talking about? All the waves and billows of God's judgment passed over Christ because he had our sins in his own body. It was a real Christ who suffered. It was a real Christ who suffered in his own body. The body prepared so that he could suffer for our sins. His own body. But we read in Revelation again about the problem. Our sins. Both of these texts. 1 Peter 2 and 24 and Revelation 1 and 5 have the same expression, our sins, our sins. He bear our sins in 1 Peter, but in Revelation chapter 1, John tells us that he washed us from our sins. You see, in case you missed it in the first speaker and you missed it in my first text, don't miss it in the second text. Text, Our sin is the problem. Our sin, that is a problem. That's a huge problem. Mainly because our sin comes between us and God. Isaiah chapter 59. God's hand is not shortened that he cannot save. His ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. But your sins, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Our sins have come between us, between us and God. Our sins are like a great barrier that block God from us, that that God cannot righteously reach through our sin and ignore it. God cannot righteously overlook our sin. He cannot sweep it under the carpet. Sin is such a problem that it must be put away. It must be cleansed. See, there's two things you need tonight. If you're not saved, you need the forgiveness of sins. That's a tremendous thing. And God can forgive your sins. But sin is such an awful thing that it's left a stain on our souls. The Bible speaks of the sin of our souls. It's left a dirty stain on our souls. And even a person who's forgiven needs to be cleansed. John, 1 John chapter 1 doesn't say the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, forgives from all sin, though it does. That's not the point he's making. The point is this. That filthy stain of sin can only be cleansed by the blood of Christ. Our sins, his own blood, his own blood. The answer to the problem of our sin is his own blood. The process, how is it possible? No. No, the, the, the illustration is used of cleansing, but this cleansing is some, it's not a physical cleansing. This is not like soap and water. In fact, the Bible speaks of that. You cannot wash away sin 
with soap and water. This is not a physical cleansing because our sin, though it affects us physically, our sin is a spiritual problem. Our sin has affected our spirits. Our sins spiritually have separated us from God. Our sins spiritually have left us dead in trespasses and in sins. Our sin is a spiritual problem. We need spiritual cleansing. In order to be right with God, there's a process. It takes nothing less than the blood of Christ to cleanse us from all sin. So let me ask you, are you cleansed? Are you cleansed from your sins? You see, the man that's listening and writing the words in, in, in Revelation chapter 1, he's listening to a great host of people speaking. We sometimes say they were singing, but the scripture doesn't say they were singing. They were saying. They were united together in this. This company of redeemed people were worshiping the Lord Jesus and saying unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Unto him be glory and honor. Unto him, he alone is worthy, for he hath washed us from our sins in his own blood. Are you in that crowd? We sometimes sing it. Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Spiritually, are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? It must take place. Every single person who's been washed in the blood of the Lamb knows the time when that happened. They were cleansed from their sins. But not only the price, the, the process, but there's a tremendous price that was paid. The Lord Jesus, while he lived on this earth, just like you and I, blood flowed through his veins but that's not enough he took upon him flesh and blood but that's not enough he lived here for 33 years among sinners and he lived a spotless life but that's not enough there's a price that must be paid in order for you and I to be cleansed from our sins washed in his own blood what was that that blood must be shed his life must be given it was either his life or ours our souls would be lost forever our lives would be lost in hell forever or he would shed his blood from his own body on the tree. And that's exactly what happened. That's the grand message of the gospel, is that Christ died for our sins. Christ shed his precious blood that be cleansed from our sins. Calvary's cross, his blood flowed freely. We sometimes sing it as we remember the Lord Jesus, see from his head, his hands, his feet, his side, sorrow and love flow mingled down. What are we talking about? The blood of Christ flowed at Calvary, where he willingly shed his blood to pay the price of our sins. What a price. His own blood. Nothing less would do. Nothing more was required, but nothing less than the precious blood of Christ. Peter tells us we're redeemed, not with corruptible things, such as silver and gold from the vain tradition received from our fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. There's nothing like it. And that multitude in heaven is singing or singing. 
together as they worship unto him. He's worthy who washed us from our sins, his own blood. Lastly, we read of his own word. I like this one because it's what it's what you get tonight. It's what you need tonight. Over almost 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus died and shed his blood. You weren't there. You didn't see it. I wasn't there. I didn't see what happened. Very few people out of the 7 billion or probably 14 billion that have lived on this earth were there. Very few people out of all those billions. So how does a person 1987 years later or so, how does a person now, today, lay hold of something that happened almost 2,000 years ago? How do we make what happened there ours today? Do we have to picture Calvary in our mind and transport ourselves back there? No, no, no. Do we have to somehow get some feeling about what, how, how gory the details were of Calvary? Absolutely not, friend. No, no. We get back to Calvary by his own word. His own word. God communicates to us by his own word word i took the time to count these up in the gospels alone four books matthew mark luke and john the lord jesus said this 120 times i think 121 so over 120 times he said this i say unto you i say unto you Not Moses says, not God says, not the scripture says, not your fathers say, but I say unto you, the authority of his word, I say unto you. In fact, in John chapter 3, the man that came to the Lord Jesus by night, Nicodemus, he had the answers of the fathers. He had the answers of the scriptures, and the Lord Jesus, right in verse number three, sweeps that out of the way, and he says, Jesus answered and said unto him, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I say unto you, ye must be born again, verse seven. I say unto you, the authority of his own word. All authority in heaven and earth is given to the Lord Jesus. This, he says, I have received from my Father. People recognized it, you know. When they listened to the Lord Jesus speaking, they, they, they marveled. They, they were amazed at his authority. They said, where did this man get this authority? They said that among themselves. Finally, they came to him and they said, tell us, tell us. By what authority do you do these things? They recognized that he spake with authority, he acted with authority, and it was an authority that they had never seen before. Why? Because it came from heaven. It was the authority of the creator. It was the authority of God himself. The son of God lived here on earth, and he spake with all the authority. When he said, I say unto you, his own word. Word like that can be relied on. Such authority can be believed. And you need to believe his word. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. That's what the Lord Jesus said. He that heareth my word 
with all the authority of God behind him, he spake the word and it was done. You can take the authority of his word and believe it. But there's another thing. When the Lord Jesus spake, a lot of times people didn't ask him questions, and yet the Gospels records this over 64 times. Jesus answered. There was no question asked, but Jesus answered. I gave you one example of that. Nicodemus said, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest. And Jesus answered and said unto him. He didn't ask a question. But the Lord Jesus was giving him the answer to the question that needed to be asked. You must be born again. The real question in Nicodemus's mind when he came to the Lord Jesus is, how can I be right with God? The real question you need to be asked in tonight is, how can you be right with God? How can your sins be forgiven? How can you be saved this very night? And the answer is this. Jesus answered and said unto him. Over 64 times, he gave the answer. The right answer. The answer that you need. The answer that can be believed. The answer that can be relied on. He is the answer. That's the truth of it. Sometimes people are really smart. I'm not one of them. But I'm probably looking at some of you folks, and you're a lot smarter than I am. They're really smart. And, and if, if hard questions are put to you, you can come up with the answer. That's, that's not what I'm talking about here. The Lord Jesus was very intelligent. He was the very creator of intelligence. He was intelligence personified. But that's not what I'm talking about. It's not that he had the answer and that he spoke the answer. He is the answer. The Lord Jesus is the answer you need. If you are in your sins, in plain English, you need the Lord Jesus. If you are not right with God, you need the Lord Jesus. If you are lost, you need the Lord Jesus. You need him, himself. He is the answer to our sin. He is the answer to heaven. He is the only way into heaven. Listen to his own words. I am the door by me if any man enter in. What is he saying? That he's literally a door? No, no. He is the way to heaven. He is the only entrance to heaven. Without Christ, there's no entering heaven. Without him, you don't have the answer. You still have the problem. He is the answer. But there's one more part with this I'm done. He's not only the authority and the answer. The Lord Jesus, his word is the assurance of salvation. The absolute assurance of salvation is found in his word. Listen to his word. I give unto my sheep eternal life, and they shall never perish. Would you like to have that? He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. The absolute assurance of his word. Listen to the people in John chapter 4. A woman came from the well, and she ran into the city, and she says to the men, Come see a man. Come see a man that told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? They must have believed her because they came out and listened to him. They told him to stay for a few days. And he stayed. And he kept speaking to them. They turned to the woman and they said, now we believe. 
not because of your saying, come see a man. But we have heard his own word. His own word. We listen to his word, and he has convinced us that he is the savior of the world. And they believed on him. They got the assurance, not from the preacher, the woman. You'll not get your assurance from me tonight. I can't give you that. Not from a preacher, but from his own word. There's where the assurance of salvation comes. I'm looking at the faces of some people here, and they've been saved a long time. Good to see you, folks. It's easier to preach when I got a few faces to preach to. You've been saved a long time. How do you know you're saved? Oh, you say, I feel it. It's been, it's just been growing every day. That's not how you know you're saved. You know that. You know you're saved because you got it from his own word. That's where our assurance comes from. That's how anybody knows they're saved. Even children, how do they know they're saved? They get it from his own word. And they can say like these men in John chapter 4, now we believe. We have heard his own word. What a precious thing God has given us when he gave us his own word. And we can rely on it. The God that cannot lie has promised eternal life to those that accept his word. He promised that before the world even began. And we can rely on his own word. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank thee for the word of God. We thank thee that it's his own word. He's not repeating angels. He's not repeating someone else. This is originated right in the very heart of God himself. And he has given us his own word. We thank thee that the one who gave us his word is the same one who shed his own precious blood when he died, nailed in his own body to the tree. We thank thee for the Lord Jesus. Thank thee for all that he gave. He gave himself a ransom for us all. We give thanks for the Lord Jesus and pray that thou wilt bless thy word and save precious souls for whom he died. We pray in his name. Amen.